Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome cordially Professor Martin Percy for giving a speech on shopping for God. <laughs> the challenge facing global, global faith and public life. Well, good evening everybody, and uh, thank you very much to Hussein for uh, that very warm welcome. Uh, it's very good to be back amongst you again, uh, very good to be here once again in the Alma Tomb Institute, and as Hussein referred to in his remarks, uh, we're immensely pleased and proud and indeed privileged to have our links with this uh, fine institution. Uh, we host uh, twice a year now uh, quite a number of uh, young women from the uh, Gulf states who come and stay with us for the, the ATP, the course essentially on leadership and culture and faith. And they join us for about uh, five days, uh, twice a year now. And uh, it's, uh, it's always wonderful to host them and staff as well. And uh, wonderful to have Hussein here and Al-Haj, who's been one of our visiting fellows as well. So it's really good to uh, be here and uh, to be back amongst friends. Um, I need to say right at the very beginning that um, I, I have not written, uh, quite deliberately, uh, a formal text. There's, there's lots of reasons for this, uh, but one of the main reasons is it's Friday evening. Uh, and I thought actually you might prefer something just a little bit more extempore and chatty. Uh, now, this is being recorded, so I'll have to be uh, very careful that I don't get too chatty, uh, otherwise I might regret that. But. Uh, You'll be pleased to know that when we do come to questions, uh, you can ask what you want about uh, women bishops, uh, the state of the Church of England, uh, my views on the new Archbishop of Canterbury, and uh, your question won't be recorded, and thankfully neither will my answer. So I think maybe that's all right. But in the uh, hour or so that we've got, what I want to do is uh, sketch for you, if I can, uh, just some of the issues which I think are facing uh, global faith. I'm going to, of course going to talk about Christianity, but uh, I'm actually more interested in faith generally and the impact of consumerism, post-capitalism, and to an extent uh, the revolution in communications uh, and the way in which that is impacting faith today. Because it seems to me that if I could put this in uh, a sort of... Uh, a soundbite, you might say these days that uh, many of our young people in higher education and in schools are overschooled but undereducated. Thanks very much. Uh, and by that I mean that uh, there's an awful lot of knowledge out there, a lot of information that you can soak up, but not necessarily a great deal of wisdom that goes with it. Does that sound like a familiar problem to you? Uh, I'm figuring that with the average age of the room, most of us will nod our heads at that because, of course, we're much wiser than those who are younger than us. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I want to do is just uh, tell you, uh, just give you a, a, a few vignettes, some stories, really, to set the context for this so that you really understand where I'm coming from and see if these resonate with you in relation to consumerism and faith. Some of these stories are quite personal. Um, but uh, again, you'll see where I'm coming from. So here's uh, story number one, and it's about uh, me, and it's about my son, and it's about a cub pack. Uh, and I'm going back about 10 years. I've got uh, two sons. They are 19 and 16, respectively. So our house smells of uh, socks and links, that curious <laughs> teenage odour that only boys can generate in a house, you know what I mean? Um, but if I go back about 10 years to when we used to live in Sheffield, uh, where we were both uh, at the time, um, I've only to recall, I think, one evening, which was uh, early April, I think I can almost date it precisely, it would have been around about uh, 2002, and I drove up one evening to pick up my uh, son from Cuffs. Uh, he would have been uh, eight or nine at the time. And um, when I got to the uh, cub hut, uh, there was a big queue of parents outside, all waiting to get in to pick up their sons. But the difference that evening was that all the parents were uh, clutching a letter from our Kayla, just a letter. And they were all discussing the letter. And the letter, uh, which I got hold of, said this. Uh, dear parent, I'm writing to you today to tell you 
that it is, or to inform you, that it is uh, St George's Day Parade Sunday at the end of the month. Please make sure that your son is there with a clean kit, shiny shoes, and please note, attendance is compulsory. Yours sincerely, Arcana. Now you might wonder to yourself, why would a letter like that cause a group of parents in their 30s and 40s irritation and anxiety? Well, I can think of a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, a uh, clean kit. Where would you get that from in a house of boys? In fact, finding the kit would be the challenge, you know. <laughs> Where's the woggle? That's always the weekly hunt, isn't it, really? I think we could agree, couldn't we, as well, that uh, shiny shoes is a rather dated cultural motif. Uh, most children, it seems to me these days, have no idea what shoe polish looks like. When shoes get scuffed and aged, you just buy new ones, because nobody actually cleans shoes anymore, do they? <laughs> but no, um, the parents were not debating either of those things. They were debating the curious word in the letter that was at the bottom of the page, the C word, compulsory. What could it possibly mean? One parent turned to another and said, well, I don't think our Kayla means compulsory because we um, always go away at the weekend and visit uh, relatives in Halifax and therefore this letter does not apply to us. Another parent uh, turned to their friend and said, um, we play football on Sundays which means no church service. So this letter does not apply to us either. And another parent turned to a friend and said, we only bring David because he enjoys it. And if he didn't enjoy Cubs, we would not bring him. So it cannot mean compulsory. Now, I just want to put it to you that uh, this is what I would call uh, a zeitgeist. It's one of those little snapshots in life that you suddenly kind of wake up, smell the coffee, and realise that a word like compulsory doesn't have the same purchase on your peers as it might have done on your parents or grandparents. Even I, as a theological college principal, find that when I want the students to do something, by which I do mean compulsory, I only say to them, there is a firm expectation that every member of the community will be present at this event. Sometimes I ratchet up the ante by saying, if you think you cannot be at this event, please write to me in person. Or if I want to be really serious, please make an appointment with my PA and explain why you can't be there. But even I don't use the word compulsory. Why do I not use that word? Because by and large, I think I accept I live in a world replete with choices, and I cannot make anyone do anything. Now, why is that an issue for religion at all? Well, I think it would be obvious, wouldn't it? In some respects, of course, all Abrahamic faiths talk about duties and obligations. By that, they don't mean choices. The five pillars of Islam are not pick and mix options, their obligations, although I will come on to that a little bit later and just say a word or two about what's happening globally to those. When Jesus says to uh, his uh, questioner, who says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, Jesus says, well, you know, what do you think? And the questioner says, well, I think love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus does not say, well, that's good, but of course there are other options. In other words, there are things in faith that are non-negotiable. And yet, of course, we live these days in a world that is replete with options and choices, in which, if I may say so, spirituality and religion are increasingly teased apart. The more the rise of the individual or individualism and religious consumerism comes on stream. Again, to uh, just uh, pick up a, a personal story at this uh, point, uh, when we first moved to Oxford, I uh, remember having breakfast with my eldest son one morning, and uh, apropos nothing in particular, he just turned to me over the cereals and said, 
Dad, he said, uh, what's your second favourite religion? <laughs> now, it's a really good question, isn't it? What's your second favourite religion? But packed into that question, of course, is the assumption that I have chosen my first favourite religion. That I chose Christianity, and interestingly, I chose this subtle uh, brand of Christianity called Anglicanism. Of course, that's a really odd thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, why anyone would choose that? But of course, his assumption was that people chose their faith. Faith, on the other hand, many religious traditions basically don't talk about you choosing the faith, but the faith choosing you. It selects you. Islam has a tradition not of converts, but reverts. Christianity doesn't talk about people choosing faith, but of God choosing them. But the individual consumer, of course, assumes that they are at liberty to pick and mix and shape and so forth. There's other interesting aspects about this as well in relation to consumerism. When I used to lecture in uh, the University of Sheffield uh, some years ago, I used to begin the sociology of religious classes uh, every year, usually with about 100 students present. Uh, bearing in mind they would be ranged 18, 19, that sort of age. And I would ask for a show of hands at the beginning of the lecture series, how many people in the room regarded themselves as religious? And usually the uh, show of hands would be around about 5%, maybe a little bit more, sometimes 10. People also putting their hands up in this anthropologically significant way, just right, slightly sheepishly, just a little hand like that, you know, very English. <laughs> Don't want to be too keen. Now I said, well, that's interesting, thank you. That's about right, I said, for a, you know, a group like this. Uh, let me ask you a second question. How many of you would say that you were spiritual? And it was very, very rare for less than 85% of the room not to raise their hands. And this time, of course, they don't go up half like this, they go up like this. They put their hands up. And then I say, well, tell me about this spirituality of yours. What does it consist of? And some people would say, well, you know, lots of things. You know, I've got this really interesting collection of books from Waterstones. I've been to Glastonbury. I've got a pebble from my owner. I've got a candle from a temple I went to when I was abroad. I've got these strange beads, which I think are Islamic, or maybe they're Hindu, I'm not sure, but they're meaningful to me. In that sense, these students, many of whom we would say perhaps were secular, were self-identifying as spiritual beings, but not as explicit religious followers. In other words, they were what we might call these days empowered religious consumers. Now, I find this all very interesting in our modern world, of course, because we're constantly being told all the time that the world is less religious, the world is becoming more secular, particularly, in, I suppose, in the West, and in fact, you'll find survey after survey, time after time, demonstrates <coughs> that religion is alive and well and kicking in the modern world. It would have been a very brave individual, I think, who would have predicted that the first 10, 12, 15, 20 years of the 21st century would turn out to be dominated by religion. Uh, not just wars, but people's faith, the way in which that's shaping the modern world, and the way in which that has crept once again back to the top of the agenda. But it's interesting underneath that, that people are managing to combine their consumerist identities with spirituality, and forms of religious consumerism which are producing new and interesting ways of living in contemporary society which are not excluding religion but at the same time are hardly, I would say, including it on terms that would satisfy most religious leaders or indeed uh, make them particularly happy. Another thing to mention here is of course this whole curious business about consumerism and religion. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, come across the remarkable work of uh, David Putnam, his book Bowling Alone, where he talks about the collapse of American society and the rise of individualism. But one of the things he says in his book quite early on is that if you want to look 
at what's happening in the world today, you need to look at how people spend their leisure time. That's an important clue into how religion and society are cohering. He comes up, as you would expect, with a number of very interesting statistics. He points out, for example, that in 1952, 60 years ago, the average American couple watched four hours of television together a week. Just four. You could argue that in 1952 there wasn't very much on, certainly wasn't very much on in this country. But there was more TV in America. That figure today, in 2012, is close to 20 hours a week. So what's happened to the rest of that time that's been consumed by television? Putnam says it's been taken out of things like round tables, uh, bowling together as neighbours, uh, community activity, coming out to lectures on Friday evening. Instead, what people are doing is, he says, they're watching the glowing electronic hearth in the corner of the room, by which he means the television. And, of course, even that is a very singular activity these days, because it used to be, even 20 years ago, a family activity, because very few families in this country own more than one television. But now, of course, it's very common for many families to have one in every bedroom, and even if you're not watching it in the bedroom, you can get it on your handheld, your iPad, or your computer. In fact, you never need to miss a thing, do you? Because consumerism and communication have come together in a very, very powerful alloy to give this extraordinary power to the individual, such, of course, that it means that we lose our social and communal, uh, our communal activities. But what about consumerism in all of this? Well, as the uh, notes to this evening's lecture rather infer, um, I don't think this is a new problem. It's certainly not a new problem for Christianity. You only have to go back to the Reformation to see that one of the seeds of the Reformation was not just nationalism, nor was it just religious ideology. It wasn't simply people cottoning on to the idea that John Calvin might be a very good thing for Scotland and goodness knows what might be a very good idea for England. It was also, as a number of scholars now say, because of the very early powerful forces of consumerism that were also unleashed with the Protestant spirit. The same thing that Max Weber refers to in his work, uh, relating, of course, the two. And I think of one critique uh, just recently of the Reformation, which talks, for example, about the fact that when uh, Luther was publishing his pamphlets, uh, the one thing that set him apart from earlier reformers was, of course, this huge revolution in printing. And it meant, of course, that every time his tracts were confiscated, sometimes literally rounded up, uh, taken away and burnt, it was possible that same night to produce another thousand on a different printing press and get them into people's hands. If you like, it's the earliest example we have of handheld communication, <laughs> where you could really get religious messages that people wanted, shot for, bought for very, very little money, small fennecs or pennies or whatever they would be, because, of course, this put something into their hands that they could purchase and they could identify themselves as religious consumers, I think, even 500 years ago. Perfectly possible. And no amount of state or Roman Catholic interference at that time could uh, countervail that, couldn't overcome it. And of course, one bishop complained about Luther that every time they confiscated all the tracts about Luther, all that would happen would some other printing press would come in and reproduce an even greater number on cheaper paper so that the great mass of people got even more religious consumerism than they'd lost the previous week. You just can't control communication, except through extreme censorship, and you can't control people's desires, except through rationing. And in our world today, where so much is available through the media, through the internet, through mobile phones, through television, through satellite, these things are simply impossible to control. What does that mean then for religious consumers? Well, I want to suggest to you that it means uh, at least a couple of things. 
Firstly, it means that um, people can choose between faiths. Back to my son's question, I suppose. Dad, what's your second favourite religion? Uh, I did pose this question once to uh, an extremely senior Anglican clergyman, and uh, he sat there and stroked his beard. You probably guess who I'm talking about now. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, oh, hard to say. I guess it might be Buddhism, but, you know, don't quote me. <laughs> but there you have it, you see. We have access to that tradition, and, of course, you could make a choice. You could. And then again, of course, it's not just about choosing between traditions, choosing between denominations. <clears throat> again, one of the, uh, uh, the statistics that uh, Putnam directs us to is the difference between belonging to a Christian denomination now and belonging to one even 50 or 60 years ago. The transfer rate between denominations in the United States of America used to be around about 3%. That means that if you were born a Methodist of Methodist parents, it was a 97% chance that you would remain as a Methodist. Because why would you shift? You know, everything you like about Methodism is what you like about your parents and your grandparents. But that rate today of transfer is an astonishing 36%. It's gone up 12-fold in my lifetime. What does that mean? That means, of course, people don't go to the church of their parents' allegiance, they don't go to the church necessarily into which they were baptised, or to which they even belonged last year. They go to the church that suits them best, that fits with their values, because they are an empowered religious consumer. They can drive, they can get there, and because they can do that, they therefore have everything they need in hand to make an informed choice about their religious proclivities. This is what T.S. Eliot says in his uh, rather famous poem, Choruses from the Rock. I journeyed to London, to the time-kept city where the river flows with foreign flirtations. There I was told we've too many churches and too few chop houses. There I was told, let the vicars retire. Men do not need the church in the place where they work, but where they spend their Sundays. The church must forever building, for it is forever decaying, within and attack from without. For this is the law of life, and you must remember that while there is time of prosperity, the people will neglect the temple, and in times of adversity, they will decry it. And so he goes on to talk about the desolation.